generation has had some event that it seems like it has to be the end times. Can you speak to the thought that we are more prepped for the end times now than before? You know, besides the fact that we are obviously further along in, in, in time. Well, I love that question. By the way, um, sending me the questions early is really a blessing because most of the Q&As I've done, I don't hear them until the moment. So that's why at least I started writing on my little uh, marker board here that I use in the classes. Because in most of the classes I teach, when they ask the questions, it's right then and you're on the spot. So um, this is really a blessing. So thanks for sending me these. Uh, right here is the, the paradigm that I use um, for answering questions, especially this one. Um, the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to read it, uh, Acts 19, 9 and 10. I didn't know until I started these virtual classroom times that Paul's normal teaching method in the local churches, as we'll see in Acts 19, was Q&A. It was uh, actually the, the Greek word is dia legomai. Dia means through and legomai means to talk. We get English dialogue from it. But it says this, um, but when uh, some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, uh, before the multitude, he departed and withdrew with the disciples, reasoning, there's the word, uh, dia legomai, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, and he continued for two years, and all who dwelt in Asia heard the gospel. This word's used 13 times for six different local churches. In fact, I wrote them down here in my notes. That's why I want to see them. Thessalonica, Paul's first epistle, he dialogued, Acts 17.2. Athens, member Mars Hill and all that, Acts 17.17. 17. Corinth, Ephesus, Troas, and Caesarea. So for your question, this one, uh, every generation has had some event that seemed like the end times. Uh, what, what does the Bible say about that? And so basically... I have attached um, a verse because whenever I hear a Q&A, I always attach a verse to it because that's just how my mind works. My mind is like a file cabinet and every news article I read, every when I read Drudge every day, I actually, in my mind, by most of the article headers, I put a verse. It's kind of like, you know, uh, 2 Timothy 3, you know, men will be lovers of their own selves and, you know, brutal and hard and all that stuff. All those verses come out from the headlines. So your question, uh, can you speak to the thought that we are more prepped for the end times than anyone before? The, the verse I have that answers that is in Matthew 24, 33. And uh, let me get there. And, and uh, any of you that are... Um, you know, watching this, I would encourage you to go to these passages and, and actually start collecting um, key verses that connect with the questions people are asking. As a pastor for over 30 years, I would have to say I've rarely heard a new question. There's the same questions that are on the minds, whether they're uh, I do Q&As with, with college kids. Uh, Bonnie and I just did uh, a collection of universities across the South, uh, all the campus leaders that are, that are doing evangelism on the campuses. They're all students, and they're kind of like lay evangelists in all these campuses. And, and we did a whole series of questions for them. And after I got done answering them, I, I looked at Bonnie, my student that distracts me all the time, and I said, honey, they're the same questions we heard 20 years ago. So here's what Jesus said, and I'll, I'll read you Matthew 24, verse 33. So you also, when you see all those things, know that it is near at the doors. Know what is near? The second coming of Christ. But what verse 33 says most people haven't noticed is that Jesus is continuing with what he started in verse 8, he said, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 33, when you see all these things, all these things. By the way, both 
Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. So Jesus talks about the end of days three times. In Matthew 24, in Luke 21, he gives a sermon about the end. And in Mark 13. And in all three of these passages, Jesus emphasizes one word. When you see all these things happen. Uh, I'll read to you. Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 33. So you also, when you see all these things, know it, that's his second coming, is near at the doors. And then verse 34. And this is the answer to the question. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What Jesus said is that there are a collection of what he called birth pangs and birth pangs as a father of eight. I've never experienced them, but I've sure witnessed them. And they start with a flutter and they end with a bang and they only grow and get harder and harder and harder and closer together. And Jesus said, they're going to be birth pangs that are these trends. And yes, every generation has thought they've seen a few of them. Like one of the trends is persecution. Uh, another trend is uh, false teachers. Another trend is kind of a world leader, like an antichrist. And every generation has seen uh, warfare, famine, earthquakes. But Jesus didn't say when you see persecution or false teachers or antichrist or war or famines. What Jesus said is, Matthew 24, 33, when you see all, what are the all? Well, we're the first and only generation that has seen everything the Bible says that will be global. Now think about that word, we, global. They didn't even know it was a globe back then. I mean, they thought it was flat. I don't mean the people in the Bible, I mean the world. The world really thought that the earth was flat. That's why they didn't want to sail too far. They'd fall off the edge. But Jesus said there would be events the whole world would see. The whole world would experience. I, I have a list of them. I, I keep this list right here in my Bible. Uh, Daniel says global travel. Daniel also says global knowledge. Now look at this. I'm going to pull out my phone. I have access right now to everything that has ever been known about any topic in the world, and it's called Google. And every person on earth can tune in to this global knowledge base. What generation in history? In the 1800s? No, nope. they could go to the Library of London or New York. But the whole world? Never. Global travel? People didn't travel globally. Not even at the height of the empire. Uh, global weather awareness? That's another one. Jesus said right here in, in Luke 21. He said people are going to be watching the weather and it says the whole world will get afraid. Afraid? There could be a typhoon in the South Pacific and nobody would have known about it in Europe unless maybe some European ship sank and didn't return, then they'd wonder. Jesus said the whole world would be watching weather. The whole world in, in Revelation uh, chapter 11 would be communicating. It says when the, when the two, you know, the, the two witnesses are killed by the Antichrist, the whole world talks about it. The whole world? Roman emperors died. In, in the time of the Bible. And the army didn't even know for six months. Six months. Yet over a space of three days, it says in Revelation, everyone on earth will know the two witnesses died and we'll watch them.
That's another sign. Another global sign is global, not only communication, but television. They're seeing it. Global evangelism, Matthew 24, that's, that's right there in verse 14, near verse 33. So this, this, this whole list, uh, digital money, you know, buying without a number, global tracking, he's going to hunt down the Antichrist. That means he's tracking people. How about weapons? Uh, it says in Matthew 24, look at verse 21, if you're in your Bibles, there'll be great tribulation that has not been in the world this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days, verse 22, were shortened, no humans would live. They wouldn't survive. There's never been weapons until 1945 was the dawning of global weapons. The 1950s saw the perfecting of global weapons. 1960s saw the delivery mechanism, rockets. Now, no one thinks twice of it, that, that we have weapons of global destruction. So I could go through this whole list, uh, global peace, prosperity, materialism, global hatred for the Jews. All of those things, the Bible said, would there would be greater frequency. That's what birth pangs are. First, Jesus said, you've got to see them all. You've got to see global travel and knowledge and weather and communication and evangelism and pandemics. <laughs> That's why I'm in my virtual classroom, a global pandemic. We never thought of that until it, it the whole world now is counting how many infections and how fast and their curve and flatten and unbelievable. But Jesus said, when all those global trends, global trends become birth pangs, what, what is a birth pang? Greater frequency, greater intensity, greater visibility. Frequency, intensity, visibility. That's what Jesus said is going to be going on when the the generation that sees all of those things he mentioned and sees them happening around the world that everyone recognizes. I mean, no one questions global knowledge. No one. We, we think it's our right to be online. But when they start intensifying, getting more frequent, and everyone has their eyes on them, now, this is, what, this is what the Bible says. If every generation has been prepped, here's the prep Jesus wants. Now, whenever you talk about prophecy, you always should go to Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Because... Yes, sir. You can't see what you just wrote, so just, just so you know. How about that? Yeah, perfect. Keep telling me that because uh, I get so excited down here that uh, unless my student waves at me, I, I might even get off the camera. But look at Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, because I think prophecy has lost its punch. Um, I think everyone says, uh-huh, I've heard that. I've seen that. Uh, yeah, I bought Hal Lindsey's book or whoever, you know, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy that writes, what's his name? Rosenberg. Joel Rosenberg. Uh, yeah. You know, I've already got that book. No, no. This is the purpose of prophecy. And, and what I call, I have written in my Bible by Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. Now, we've all heard that. When you don't come to church on Sunday night, the pastor reads that, you know, on Sunday morning, telling you you should feel bad and come Sunday night. That's not the purpose of this verse. Look, look what it says at the end of 25. But exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day, the day, the day approaching, the end times, the generation that's seeing global trends that are amplifying, getting more intense, more visible, more frequent. Hebrews 10 says 
that we are to be motivated because we know that day is coming. So what do we do? Uh, you know, protect ourselves, uh, you know, fortress, uh, get into some kind of a siege, you know, castle mentality. No. Verse 24 says, consider one another to stir up love and good works. The coming of Christ is to make us want to be ready at any moment for him to come and us to reach out to every believer we're near. And basically, it says them to stir, verse 24, up love and good works. The word stir is the Greek word paroxysm. Paroxysm? Do you know what that word means in English? It's a paroxysm is kind of like a, a jolt. It's a it's a something that, that just really impacts you. I'm supposed to be impacting people. Now, this is what I do with my students, and I'm so used to doing this, you know, two classes a day that I'll do it with you. All the time that I discipled people in the local church as a professor and now in the virtual classroom. I look at young people and not so young people and I say, where's the last place you read in God's word? Tell me one thing that the Lord touched your heart with that, that you are praying he'll do in your life. So tell me about your devotions. Tell me about your time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then tell me what verse you're memorizing that, that's changing your life. What, what scripture are you memorizing? You want to stir some of them up for love and good works? Ask them the hard questions. Where are you in the word? What word are you hiding in your heart and meditating on? And here's the last one I ask them that shakes them up. I said, when's the last time you verbally shared the gospel? Tried to lead someone to Christ? Told them about your hope in Christ? I used to do that as a staff pastor with my whole staff. And there'd be 10, 12, 20, 25 people on staff, however big the church was. We'd meet for our weekly Bible study and prayer time. And I'd start down and I'd say, where's the last time you're in the Word? Tell us what you're learning. What verse are you memorizing? And they could ask me. I had people come to me and say, I don't like coming to those meetings. It makes me feel bad if I haven't witnessed to someone or memorized a verse. I said, I'm just being obedient. I'm supposed to paroxysm you, verse 24 stir you up to love and good works. So what motivated the early church? The second coming of Christ. And the question is for your, whoever asked this, are we prepped? Yeah, we're prepped. We're the only generation that sees all of the birth pangs starting. Now, does it mean this week? Could be. Does it mean this year? Could be. Could it be this decade? Could be. Could it be longer? Could be. But I'm supposed to live like Jesus was coming to get me today. Why do I think that? Well, Paul thought it back in 1 Thessalonians 4. In 52 AD, 1950 some years ago, Paul said, we which are alive and remain will be caught up. Paul thought Jesus was coming 1900 years ago. But Paul did not see everything Jesus said was coming. In Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, were our generation is the first one to see all of them. And so are we prepped? Really prepped. Should we be living like Jesus was coming today? Yes. Should we not be discouraged if he doesn't come in our week or our month or our year? No, but he'll be glorified if we live that way.